Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. I was one, I'd like to share with you some of the work we've been doing in developing new targets for therapy in ovarian cancer, specifically on ERB3. Uh, for those of you who don't work on ovarian cancer, just a little bit of background. It's the leading cause of uh, death from gynecologic malignancy in the United States. We get pretty robust response to initial therapy, that's chemotherapy and surgery. 70 to 80% of patients will go into remission, but Almost always the disease, the disease will recur and it becomes increasingly platinum and chemotherapy resistant. So new therapies are definitely needed. It turns out, however, that identification of novel therapeutic targets in this disease has been difficult. I'm gonna share with you some of the work that has been done in David's lab. This work was actually initiated by one of the postdocs in David's lab several years ago, Ching Sheng. And what she did was she did a large uh, scale shRNA screen of the 80, of 89 human tyrosine kinases in ovarian cancer cell lines. What you see here is actually the result of a secondary screen. So it was limited uh, in validating some of the potential hits. This blue bar here represents one standard deviation below the uh, median proliferation of all of the cells in the screen. What we were interested in were any proteins that had more than uh, one shRNA where we saw effects on cell proliferation that fell below this blue bar. And you can see that there were several proteins, Ephraim A4, KDR, and then the one that I'm going to focus on, ERB3, which looked to be of potential interest. ERB3 is a member of the EGFR family, certainly a family that is quite interesting in cancer. It is the silent member of the fun family. It has a non-functional kinase domain. It's activated predominantly by transphosphorylation and heterodimerization with other partners. Those are canonically other members of the family. ERB3 HER2 dimers are thought to have the most potent transformative abilities within this family of dimers. And there has been a report of association between ERB3 expression and overall survival in ovarian cancer that was published in 2006. How valid it is is perhaps a little bit up in the air, but it was certainly something that piqued our interest. The first thing we did was we looked to validate the results of the RNA screen. Um, you can see with multiple siRNAs and multiple shRNAs directed against different regions of ERB3, we got very good ERB3 knockdown and correspondingly saw uh, reproducible effects on cell proliferation. So this made us feel a little bit more comfortable. This was not just an off-target effect. We then looked to see if we could rescue the effect of ERB3 uh, knockdown by expression of a ERB3 cDNA that was resistant to the siERB3 species. I'm going to concentrate just on the right side of this uh, figure just for the sake of time. What you can see here is that with an siERB3 and a vector control, we see very good knockdown of ERB3 as well as uh, abrogation of phosphorylation of ERB3 and AKT. However, when we express the cDNA with this ERB3 that is resistant to the siERB3, you see that our ERB3 species is in fact resistant and we see complete restoration of ERB3 phosphorylation as well as AKT phosphorylation. Correspondingly, what we could see was a partial rescue of the cell proliferation defect that came with ERB3 knockdown. These data together suggested to us again an on-target effect from ERB3 depletion, we then asked if we looked across a panel of ovarian cancer cell lines, did we see ERB3 in a uh, particular set of them? And as you can see, there's a significant percentage of uh, ovarian cancer cell lines that have ERB3 expression. A significant fraction of those do have ERB3 phosphorylation, and that phosphorylation is often linked with CoIP with P85, the regulatory subunit of PI3 kinase, suggesting that what we really have here is an active ERB3 PI3 kinase signaling pathway. I'm going to just highlight for your attention these two cell lines, OBCAR8. This is the cell line in which much of the work that I've been showing you has been done. It has both ERB3 expression as well as phosphorylation of ERB3. In contrast, there are certainly cell lines such as OBCAR5 that express ERB3 but do not phosphorylate it. This turns out to be of interest because when we surveyed further to see what the effect of ERB3 shRNA was across ovarian cells, we saw that in certain ovarian cancer cell lines, this is OVCAR8, we are now in a doxycycline inducible shRB3 system. When you induce the shRB3, what you saw was profound effects on cell proliferation corresponding with robust knockdown of the protein. These are cells that have ERB3 unphosphorylated. However, when you looked in cells that have ERB, express ERB3 but do not phosphorylate it, for example, OVCAR5 cells, what you can see is that even though we can abundantly knock down the protein in certain cases, we do not see the same effects on cell proliferation, suggesting that ERB3 depletion is only effective in cells that have an activated ERB3 circuit. We then asked what was it that activated ERB3? One 
what this experiment is, is called a conditioned medium experiment. With conditioned medium, what we do is we culture the cells for 48 hours in a serum-free media. We then harvest that serum-free media, we uh, concentrate it down, and then we can add it to other cells to see if we can transfer the effects of whatever is mediating the phosphorylation. As you can see here, these are now OVCAR5 cells with conditioned medium from OVCAR8 or TOV21G cells, both of which are known to have ERB3 phosphorylation. And as can be seen here, when we added this conditioned medium to OVCAR5 cells, we could get ERB3 to be phosphorylated. It in turn co-IP'd with P85, again activating a, uh, so an active ERB3 PI3 kinase signaling pathway. If you take neuregulin, which is the known ligand of ERB3, and add it to these OVCAR5 cells, you get exactly the same effect. But if you take OVCAR5 conditioned medium, as you might expect, you do not see activation of the circuit. We asked whether or not this could in fact be neuregulin that was mediating this effect. We looked at a Western at the conditioned medium from OVCAR8 and T21G cells. It's quite faint here, but there was a suggestion at the 50 kilodalton size there was a quite strong band in OVCAR8 and a faint band in T21G that's not present in OVCAR5 cells. We then asked, could this be neuregulin? By looking at neuregulin sRNA and the effect on this band in the conditioned medium, these are now OVCAR8 cells, the conditioned medium from them, treated with neuregulin siRNAs, two different neuregulin siRNAs. And you can see that this 50 kilodalton band indeed is significantly depleted by neuregulin siRNA, suggesting it is in fact secreted neuregulin. When we took this condition medium and now we added it to OVCAR5 cells to see whether or not we would then stimulate ERB3 phosphorylation, although it's a little bit more subtle, there, this is not a complete depletion, you can see that this level of uh, ERB3 phosphorylation in OVCAR5 cells is indeed decreased, suggesting that neuregulin is indeed activating the, OV, uh, the ERB3 in these cells. Given this, we asked if we're looking in these cells that have an activated ERB3 circuit that's stimulated by neuregulin. If we knock down neuregulin, will we see similar effects on uh, cell proliferation? These are OVCAR8 cells with five different siRNA species to neuregulin. I don't have the protein blot up here, but you'll have to take my word that the knockdown was quite good. And again, you can see that there are uh, significant effects on cell proliferation. If we looked in OVCAR5 cells with inducible shRNAs against ERB3, you do not see those effects on cell proliferation. But if you look in OVCAR8 cells, again, with the addition of doxycycline, you see profound effects on cell proliferation. In the bottom panel here, this is a rescue experiment. This is, again, with a cDNA that's resistant to one of these siRNA species to neuregulin. It's resistant to this one. Again, I did not add the protein blot for neuregulin, so you'll have to take my word. But what you can see is that when you have this siRNA, sorry, the cDNA species expressed, you can restore and rescue the biochemical effect of ERB3 phosphorylation, whereas the uh, neuregulin siRNA to which it's not resistant still effectively knocks that down. And you have partial rescue of the proliferation effect here on the right. This made us think that, okay, we have an active neuregulin uh, ERB3 autocrine circuit in certain ovarian cancer cells, and in cells that have this circuit, they have a dependency on both neuregulin and ERB3. Our next question is, does this matter? Is this true in primary ovarian cancer? In a collaboration with Ronnie Drapkin, we've been collecting primary ovarian cancer cells, either from ascites or pleural effusions, and this is a panel of those cells. When you look at messenger for neuregulin, you can see that certain numbers of these cells, not all of them, have a significant amount of neuregulin expression. When we then look at protein blots of some of these cells, you can see that a certain fraction of ovarian cancer cells do indeed have ERB3 expression, and they again do indeed have ERB3 phosphorylation with co-IP of P85, an active circuit. When we looked at conditioned medium from those cells, where we were able to get it, the conditioned medium in certain cases could stimulate phosphorylation of ERB3 and OVCAR5 as well, OVCAR5 cells as well. And when you look at it, for example, DFO5 and DF14, um, you can see that this corresponds with uh, cells that we saw did have significant messenger expression. We then asked, and this has been actually quite difficult to do, what's the effect of ERB3 shRNA on primary cancer, uh, primary ovarian cancer cells? And this has turned out to be difficult because it's been very difficult to transfect these cells effectively with ERB3 siRNA or shRNA. But at least in two species, oops, both of which have the activated ERB3 neuregulin circuit, 
DF14, DF59, you can see with three shRNAs against ERB3, we see reproducible effects on cell proliferation. If we look at an inducible system, we do see some effects on cell proliferation here as well. And these are preliminary data, but certainly suggestive that this is true in primary cells. Much of this was done in a cell culture setting. We said, well, cell culture in two-dimension is not the same as in vivo or three-dimensional culture. So we looked in three-dimensional systems. These are back into OVCAR8 cells. And we looked both by spheroid formation as well as by matrigel and saw that with two SHRB3s that were inducible, we could see profound effects on cell proliferation by inducing SHRB3. And similarly, in vivo, if we induced SHRB3 in a mouse model, this is an intraperitoneal mouse model with cells that have been uh, transduced with luciferase and are followed by bioluminescent imaging. With one of our SHRB3 species, we can actually get so, some regression of tumor. In this one, we don't see significant, statistically significant decrease in bioluminescent imaging of the growth of the tumor. But in both cases, when we look at the survival of the mice from ovarian cancer, we do see prolonged survival. And finally, we said, what would be the effect of a monoclonal antibody against ERB3 and OVCAR8 cells? We entered into a collaboration with Merrimack Pharmaceuticals. They have a monoclonal antibody, which effectively does blockade ERB3 phosphorylation. And as can be seen here in a 3D model, we can see decreased growth of the OVCAR8 cells, as well as an in vivo model. You can see that this uh, results in tumor stasis as compared to a PBS-treated control. Based upon all of that data, we sort of put this together and said, okay, we do in fact have a neuregulin ERB3 activated circuit in ovarian cancer. It's true in certain primary ovarian cancer cells, although potentially not in all. And really the challenges that are coming up next are in how we translate this into clinical development. Um, and so, you know, we've been thinking very much about this, which is how do you translate these findings into the clinical setting? The first thing is we really need to determine the role of anti-ERB3-directed therapy, and that's by figuring out what's the target population. It turns out it's very hard to identify in the, -clinic in the clinical setting which tumors have an active neuregulin ERB3 circuit. IHC has not been effective so far, and so this is something that we've been working both in partnership with drug companies as well as with uh, collaborators uh, throughout the Harvard institutions and in trying to find a mechanism of identifying this. Additionally, uh, much of the work I've shown you has been in ovarian cancer cell lines. I'd mentioned that it's been difficult to transfect and transduce the primary cells, but we have some preliminary data and are building on that to look at the effect and role of ERB3 and ERB3 phosphorylation in primary cells and tumors. And finally, I think the real challenge, there, another real challenge here is understanding what ERB3 is really doing and what its partners are. Because as we know and have learned through time, the EGFR family is a very plastic family. And ERB3 has been known to partner with all of the members of the EGFR family and can also partner with other members, as Jeff Engelman has shown, with met phosphorylation of ERB3, meeting resistance to gefitinib in certain cells. So, Understanding all of that, I think, will give us greater insights in how we explore the role of ERB3 and really develop it into the, translate, into the clinical setting. I think I am out of time, so I'm going to fast forward through the next couple of slides to the acknowledgments. And there are a lot of people who have been working on this. Certainly, David has been an incredible mentor. I mentioned Ching Sheng as a postdoc in the lab who started this work. And then, of course, Ronnie Drapkin, Bill Hong, Andrew, Andy Kong. So this is great, great work. I have a question. Uh, so there was a clinical trial with, with pertuzumab in, yes. in ovarian carcinoma. Uh, this was a study that was done by Genentech. And interestingly enough, uh, the study was, was negative, but they had, um, the study was negative, but they had a subset of patients in which they were looking at the level of ER. Um, uh, so basically, ER becomes unregulated whenever there is neuregulin. And looking at this subset of, of patients, they, they did see clinical benefits. So I think there is at least uh, one clinical indication that goes along with what you say. So uh, I don't know what do you think about that paper. Yes, so the pertuzumab uh, study has been certainly a challenge to interpret. So the pertuzumab was uh, come up by Genentech, as you know, as actually an antibody that is meant to block ERB2, ERB3 dimers. And so it's actually meant 
in a certain ways, Genentech has mar marketed against as an HER anti-HER2 agent as opposed to an anti-HER3 agent. It does not block, for example, EGFR or B3 dimers, and it doesn't block RB3 or B4 dimers. When they did the study, they did, in fact, see this potential benefit in a small population. They kind of pulled it out. It's, you know, I think it's something that needs to be revalidated in another study if they were to pursue it. Um, they also found something where they saw that cells with a low expression of ERB3 mRNA is a ratio to ERB2 actually seem to respond better. And that maybe speaks to the ERB2, anti-ERB2 effects of pertuzumab. for uh, neuregulin and phosphor 3 isn't that enough to put you over the top in terms of thinking? Yes. So we were certainly hoping so. It turns out there's not a neuregulin antibody that's commercially available at this moment that's very effective in IHC. And um, I skip through this slide, but it turns out that ERB3, phospho ERB3 in IHC is very unpredictable. You can see beautiful staining patterns like here where it's membranous, it looks exactly like you would expect it to be, but you also can get this weird focal patchiness, and in fact, you can also get what might be in fact a fixation artifact of a leading edge that stains and the tumor itself being negative. What was most worrisome about these uh, antibodies, however, was that when we compared them to parallel samples of fresh frozen uh, tissue that were, uh, that were looked at by Western blot with validated antibodies, they did not always correspond, and that made us very worried. Okay. The, the other comment that I have is that, uh, I mean, as, as you mentioned, HER3 per se is not that important, maybe in ovarian carcinoma, and you mentioned that uh, we ought to explore the HER1 and HER3. Uh, and, and there's Absolutely. some antibodies that are blocking HER1 and HER3 in the clinic. Yes. So, and you know about them. Uh, so maybe that is something that also would be worthwhile because HER3 per se, without any heterodimer, heterodimer partner, has no capacity to do exactly. anything, right? I mean, that, that's pretty solid, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think, you know, there's, yeah. there's data I haven't presented, but it does seem that, you know, maybe blockading HER3 phosphorylation in and of itself by, you know, it, it has to be something about what HER3 is doing by dimerizing with other partners, I believe. Yeah. 